My view of the indices is quite ambivalent. The obligation of the signatory states to submit indices certainly contributed significantly to many countries designing and implementing more ambitious climate protection measures after the Paris Climate Agreement was concluded. Taking into account the current indices, we are on a 2.6 degrees Celsius pass, whereas at the time of the conclusion of the Paris Agreement, we are still on a 3.5 degrees Celsius pass. However, the further development of NECs is stalling. By mid-2025, only 11 countries had formally submitted improved NECs. Even so, the official UNFCCC submission deadline expired in the first quarter of the year. Because of the NECs lack comparability and transparency. From a higher level perspective, it is currently still difficult to assess the level of ambition of the countries in a sufficiently robust and fair manner. In addition, NECs are only geared toward a medium-term time horizon, with NECs to be submitted this is the year 2035. However, limiting climate change requires a clear long-term target to which countries commit themselves. Designing the right energy mix is a major challenge. It includes considerable potential for conflicts and must therefore be based on transparent criteria. In my view, the energy mix of the future must be geared toward the following goals. Greenhouse gas neutrality, security of supply and reliability, affordability for private consumers and thus social compatibility, contribution to securing the competitiveness of the country's economy, opportunity for participation, and last but not least, social acceptance. Without any doubt, with a climate protection-oriented energy system, renewable energies will form the backbone of the energy mix. To comply with the aforementioned principles, they must be accompanied by a variety of flexibility options, such as hydrogen-compatible gas-fired power plants, load management, batteries, and other storage options, and not to forget intelligent control systems. Of particular importance for Germany is a further rapid expansion of electricity transmission and distribution networks and the development of a hydrogen network. From my perspective, conventional nuclear power plants still pose too many safety risks and there are still no convincing concepts for the final disposal of highly radioactive waste available. The investment cost for the last nuclear power plants, which went into cooperation, cooperation in Europe, have skyrocketed. Partly due to material problems and construction times have been drastically extended. This also means that there is a lack of reliability, predictability in terms of strategy when it comes to nuclear energy. It remains to be seen whether the development of small modular reactors, the so-called SMRs, will change this assessment. So far, there is still far too little reliable information available on this technology, which is mainly being driven forward by startups and little or no operational experience exists. Emissions climate protection goals can only be achieved if they are in line with economic development, social acceptance, and if they include participation formats, many climate protection measures help to reduce import dependencies and thus help to reduce vulnerabilities and are associated with significant innovation impulses from which promising export options could emerge. In my view, a transformative industrial policy is an accompanying element to climate policy is needed that encompasses the following elements. It has a clear transformative effect and supports future-oriented investments embedded in the long-term strategy. It promotes security of supply and resilience. It balances regional and social disparities. It focuses on international coordination and cooperation, for instance, with regard to green product standards. 
that works transparently and in a participatory way, that is pragmatic and learns from mistakes. Carbon pricing mechanisms are key to implementing climate protection measures. They have an important steering effect, but they need to be backed up by sector-specific measures to overcome non-economic barriers. With the introduction of the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, the CBIM, the European Union, which will be fully in place from 2026, the European Union has created an effective instrument to persuade other countries to introduce carbon pricing systems for developing countries, it will be crucial that international climate finance mechanism are further strengthened. The SUFIS are the last international climate negotiations who a new collective quantified financing target was set, meaning that by 2035, financial support from industrialized countries is to be increased to 300 billion US dollars per year. Due to the already very high debt burden of developing countries, repayable loans are of no help to them. What is needed instead are traditional grants and subsidies, as well as support simplification and risk protection for private investments. In times of geopolitical crisis and tensions, as well as an increasing focus by states on their own purely national interest, that means that, they, that we see a growing tendency of countries toward renationalization. International cooperation formats are under considerable pressure. At the same time, we are needed in order to rebuild trust among nations. With regard to climate protection and international climate governance, the progress made is far too little. Not least because of the consensus principles of the UN FCCC mechanism. This leads to considerable potential for frustration, particularly among the vulnerable countries, especially the small island states. The situation can probably only be resolved by introducing a parallel international climate protection regime as a supplement to the UNFCCC process, in which the pioneering countries can join forces and establish clear rules and standards among themselves, as well as making concrete commitments to reduce emissions.